If you've been following along over the last several episodes, we are working through a Bible study series I've titled The Christian Home, where we are taking kind of imaginary room-by-room tour of the model Christian home. Already, we've stepped up to the front door to see the coming and going uh, of of the Christian family. We've sat down in the dining room to to think about the role of fellowship and hospitality in the home. We've we've even reclined in the living room to to consider what entertainment and leisure looks like for the family. Uh, In in this episode, uh, not to get too weird with the analogy, we'll uh, get up from the living room and put our ear against the door of the master bedroom to listen to some of the conversations that happen between the Christian husband and wife. We'll also acknowledge the privacy and and, and sacredness of the precious act of consummation also happening there. I once read that at the beginning of a sermon where the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther once preached on this uh, very sensitive topic, he confessed, oh, how I dread preaching on the estate of marriage. (laughs) Uh, and, And of course, by the estate of marriage, he's He's just talking about those aspects of marriage that, that make the marriage relationship the marriage relationship. But, but he said, I'm reluctant to do it because I am afraid if I once get really involved in the subject, it will make a lot of work for me and for others. The shameful confusion wrought by the accursed papal law has occasioned so much distress and the lax authority has given rise to so many dreadful abuses and false situations that I would much prefer neither to look into the matter nor to hear about it. In other words, Luther hesitated to say anything on the topic, knowing the kind of uh, perceptions about sexuality uh, common in both church and culture in his day. He believed that that if he said the things he really wanted to say on the topic, he might stir up quite the controversy. Then he says, but timidity is no help in an emergency. (laughs) I, I love that. I must proceed. I must try to instruct poor bewildered consciences and take up the matter boldly. By the way, I can definitely relate to what Luther's saying there, though, of course, my concern isn't so much the confused approach to marriage and intimacy that was common to 16th century circles uh, like Luther was, but but my concern is, is for the understanding of our own very confused 21st century society. And if you didn't already know it, we live in a pretty confused society. I can relate to Luther's sense of caution, uh, to, to say anything about it on the one hand, and yet I respect his sense of urgency on the other hand, uh, to give some form of counsel to those sincerely confused Christians seeking answers on, on the appropriate role of the bedroom in God's plan. The fact of the matter is that this is an important topic, and, and the marriage bed, believe it or not, has a tremendous role to play in, in determining the course not only of a healthy marriage, a healthy family, and a, a healthy home, but it has a role to play even in determining the course of the church and the culture that that marriage, family, and home belongs to. Luther went on to explain, quote, the estate of marriage redounds to the benefit not only of the body, property, honor, and soul of an individual, but also to the benefit of whole cities and countries. Just just try to wrap your mind around that thought. To the benefit of whole cities and countries in that they may be guarded from the plagues imposed by God against the sins of fornication that burned the likes of Sodom and Gomorrah in flames. Just let that thought sink in for a moment. We, we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, the sexual perversion that provoked God's judgment. J- just think, what do you suppose could have prevented the outpouring of fire and brimstone from toppling those cities? I tell you, one of the things that could have made a difference was had the husbands and wives of those cities shared a righteous understanding of and therefore a righteous use for the bedroom. We wonder today why society is so wicked and perverse in its understanding of things like abortion, gay marriage, transgenderism, and all the rest. Folks, the the world is so messed up in part because their understanding of Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed— I would argue it's because that wonderful marriage model has been lost. Actually, the portion of scripture I really want to think about isn't Genesis 2.24, but but Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33, which expounds on Genesis 2.24, 
in, in the context of Ephesians 5, calls for Christians to live set apart from the world. Rather than imitating culture, we're to imitate Christ. We, we do that primarily by refraining from evil and committing to doing good. Another way we do that is by redeeming the time and, and devoting our attention to worship and ministry. Not only that, but, but all our various relationships in life, from our relationships in, in the church to our relationships in the home to our relationships in work context, all of those relationships are meant to take on their own unique forms of Christ-like service to one another. Among the relationships mentioned is the relationship of marriage. The point is made that how a husband relates to his wife and how a wife relates to her husband should act as its own gospel portrait as the two role play together the loving relationship between Christ and the church. Ephesians 5:22 says, "Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church his body and is himself its savior." Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present her to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Again, with Genesis 2.24 as a model, marriage, properly understood, serves as a means of reflecting Christ and the unique opportunity husbands and wives have to serve one another, ultimately for the purpose of positioning us for a stronger relationship with him. I'll tell you, that idea should completely transform how you and I think about any romantic Hallmark Channel ideas we may have about love and marriage. Marriage isn't about a fairy tale story that makes us feel like an honored Prince Charming or the pampered princess in the room. Real love isn't about having your particular love language or, or your spouse's love language catered to. It's about committing, not catering, but committing to your spouse's personal sanctification. It's not primarily about making one another happy. It's about making one another holy. Obviously, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be finding ways to make our spouses feel loved. But listen, more important than feeling loved is being loved. And the ultimate way of being loved is for someone to lay down their life for your good. And what greater good is there than being drawn closer to God? I like what Tim Keller has written on this point. He's said, quote, Within this Christian vision for marriage, here's what it means to fall in love. It is to look at another person and get a glimpse of the person God is creating and to say, I see who God is making you and I want to be a part of that. I want to partner with you and God in that journey. Each spouse then should give him or herself to be a vehicle for that work and envision the day that you will stand together before God seeing each other presented in spotless beauty and glory. How does that play out in marriage? Well, I I imagine it plays out in several different ways. One of the big ways, according to Ephesians, uh, is in how a husband and wife fundamentally relate to one another in their roles and responsibilities. That that speaks to the complementarian nature of a husband's leadership in the home and a wife's gracious submission to him, just as it played out for the first man and his helpmate, right, back in Eden. There's a lot we could say on how leadership and submission works in general, uh, but, but, but that's not the point of this episode. Just to say, the, the Bible tells us that's a fundamental part of the scaffolding. Well, a, another way all this plays out isn't just in a husband and wife's complementing roles and responsibilities, but in their sacred and intimate union together on a spiritual, emotional, and physical level. I mean, if you think about it, the whole idea of leadership and submission uh, happens in in lots of different relationships, not just in the home. There are such relationships in the church, in government, at the office, right? 
But listen, when God created a helper for Adam, he didn't just assign him an intern or an administrative assistant. God gave Adam a wife. He gave him a partner fit for him. And by a helper fit for him, the Bible isn't merely talking about Adam and Eve's compatibility and cooperation in in their work relationship. No, we're talking about a compatibility and a connection that goes so much deeper. It's a kind of connection that, that takes place exclusively between a husband and wife in the privacy of the bedroom. Granted, for Adam and Eve, I suppose the whole garden was their private marriage suite, but, but you get the idea. According to Ephesians 5, this special union or this intimacy happens in two practical ways. First, it happens in a husband and wife's private conversations together. And second, It happens in their private consummation together. To say something about both of those things. First, regarding the private conversations a husband and wife are meant to share, remember, as a means of drawing closer to the Lord together, the passage instructs husbands to, quote, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. On one level, intimacy happens when husbands wash their wives with the water of the word, okay? What does that mean? Well, I think it means a lot like it sounds. And and if it helps paint the picture, we can substitute the word wash with the word bathe. Husbands are expected to bathe their wives with the word. Now, before any of you start to envision some romantic uh, bubble bath style version of that where uh, the the wife gets to relax like at the spa and receive her special time of pampering, uh, that's really not the visual we need to have here. Rather, to be washed or bathed with the word is a little more, um, how shall we say, invasive. I think a better picture is is the kind of bathing that God describes in Ezekiel 16, speaking of how the Lord, in an act of mercy, first cleaned up a very unworthy, unloved, and unclean spiritual bride, Israel. And I'll warn you that the scene I'm about to read is both graphic and, to start out, not at all romantic. The passage reads, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No I pitied you to do any of these things out of compassion for you. But you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant in the field, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord. Folks, that's the kind of washing we're talking about. To be washed with the word is to be stripped down of all our coverings, spiritually speaking, and to stand naked and exposed of all the sinful dirt and grime we carry into our marriages. And it's to be scrubbed clean, scrubbed, however long that scrubbing takes, until we are pure and spotless and ready to wear those finer garments. And apparently, there's a setting for such a personal and private spiritual scrub down, at least on one level, that happens solely between a man, his wife, and God. 
Pastors cannot do this at the personalized level, on the, on the intimate level that husbands are uniquely positioned to do this with their wives. Here in a little bit, I want to talk about what those kind of, of personal, sin-exposing, soul-uncovering conversations look like practically. But, but let's notice that's not the only intimate thing happening between a husband and wife in the home. Because in addition to, quote, washing his wife with the water of the word, husbands are also told in verse 28 to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Here we're no longer talking about connecting on those emotional, spiritual levels, but now connecting on a physical level in in what I'm calling a husband and wife's private consummation together. And by consummation, I I don't just mean that, that consummating act of intercourse on the wedding night, which does establish the covenant of marriage, but but the ongoing act of intercourse on a regular long-term basis throughout one's marriage as a continuous renewal of that marriage covenant and a continuous expression of intimacy together. In 1 Corinthians 7, the Bible talks about the long-term plan for the conjugal right, as the text puts it, uh, for, for the benefit of both husband and wife, both for their spiritual good and for their physical good. Some have argued that the sole purpose of sex is for procreation and, and the preservation of the human race. And to be fair, Genesis 2 does mention God's plan for Adam and Eve to, quote, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So making babies is why God designed the sperm and the egg. Um, but, but we can't ignore 1 Corinthians 7. We can't ignore Ephesians 5. Yes, sex was created for procreation, but guess what? It was also created for pleasure and to be a portrait of Christ-like service to our spouse. And as Adam and Eve displayed in Genesis 2, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. So, again, how a man and wife converse together under the the spiritual cleansing influence of God's word and how they are consummated together in the act of of physical relations when taken together, and and a marriage does need to have both sides to this intimacy, uh, unites them in a way that reflects God's incredible grace. Remember how Ephesians 5 puts it, This mystery is profound, but I'm saying it refers to Christ and his church. Well, that gives you the biblical foundations for what happens in the bedroom, but, but now if I can, give you some biblical applications in, in what I hope is some helpful encouragement for you in your own marriage. Starting with the, the first part to all this, in that emotional and spiritual intimacy that should be happening in our private conversations, it's important a couple adopt a Christ-centered, self-denying, spouse-building, sanctifying vision for their marriages. I know it can be so easy to enter marriage with fairy tale expectations or to, to get past the honeymoon and get distracted with the goals of career and parenting and getting the kids graduated and buying that better dream home and, and saving enough money for retirement. And, and certainly all those things aren't bad things, but they aren't the chief thing. They aren't what you took a, a vow to love and cherish, forsaking all others. When it comes to marriage, the chief thing is to draw closer to one another and ultimately to draw one another closer to Christ. If that's not happening in the home behind closed doors, the rest of your labors are done in vain. Not only do you need to adopt a sanctifying vision for your marriage, but husbands, there are some specific things you can be doing to help make that vision a reality. One of the most practical things you can do is to be deliberate in bathing with your wife under the showerhead of God's word. That happens in personal and, and private and intimate conversation. How do you do that? Number one, you do that by setting time aside to talk to your wife. That might not sound very profound, but believe me, if it's not something we set aside time to do, it's not going to happen at all. You've got to sit down, tune out distraction, and talk. By the way, this doesn't have to to be done in the bedroom, but but I'll tell you, that's where Amy and I have our best conversations. Perhaps that's that's because it's the only room in in our house where we can really escape the chattering of children. But we try to do this before, before the sun is even up, before our kids start to stir. 
We'll fix ourselves a cup of coffee, return to our room, close our door, lock the door, <laughs> because kids don't always knock, right? And, and, and then we spend around 30 minutes just, just talking. I've spoken to a few Christian brothers in our church who tell me uh, what, what this looks like in their own home, uh, but because this isn't a cookie-cutter thing. W- w- one man told me he and his wife like to sit down at the kitchen table and talk. Another man told me he and his wife like to, to talk on the porch. One guy told me because of his crazy busy schedule, uh, his time to talk with his wife is, is when the two are driving together. Really, it can be in any number of contexts, but the point is to set aside time to talk. Number two, you've got to center your conversations on biblical truth. Too often, husbands and wives limit their conversations to the weather or the family calendar or when to pick up Johnny from Little League practice. All of those things may be important, but it's it's not the kind of intimate conversation we're talking about, at, at least not left to itself. Honestly, talking about everyday topics is, is perfectly fine to do, but, but the idea is to talk about those things with a reference to God's Word. It's to consider everyday issues by considering how God would have us to think about them and, and, and by drawing each other's attention to that. If a husband is leading, he's going to, to keep the conversation tethered to those thoughts. If he wants to take a more formal approach, he may even break out his Bible and, and literally read through and talk about what the Scripture has to say. For me and Amy, if, if we're not talking about a specific passage of Scripture, we may be uh, talking about an article or a book chapter or a recent sermon or some news headline or some big decision. And, and, and then what we try to do is keep a reference to God's thoughts on the matter. Whenever one of us has has messed up and sinned, that conversation may turn into an outright scrub down and, and apologies and confession may need to be spoken or, or corrections and rebukes may need to be given. All of that happening privately. Again, the, the husband should be initiating a lot of that, though there are times a wife can initiate too. In fact, ladies, if, if you want something practical you can do to help encourage these kinds of spiritual conversations, you can, you can do this on Sunday. After hearing the preacher preach his sermon, while all those words are still fresh in your minds, go home and ask your husband what his thoughts are about it. Just, just ask him a question and, and see what he says about it. As to the other part to intimacy, that being the physical part, uh, without sharing too many details, let me, let me just offer some application here too. Again, there are some practical things husbands and wives can be doing to improve this part of their marriages. The first thing I would say to couples is to approach the act of sex with a heart to serve your spouse. And guys, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily pointing my finger at you here. When Paul says to, quote, nourish and cherish your wife, that translates to don't seek to meet your own selfish desires first. To truly care for our wives' bodies, we need to accept what our wives' bodies need. And listen, that's not always a sexual encounter. Sometimes what your wife really needs is a good nap or or alone time with a good book or first dibs on, on the shower before all the hot water runs out. The husband who cares for his wife is going to allow for those legitimate needs. That doesn't mean a, a wife doesn't also need to be close to her husband. And, and so in addition to meeting those other needs, a husband should still pursue his wife in those other physical ways. I think a really practical way to make that happen is to be sure a husband is home when he needs to be home. Of course, we, we have responsibilities outside the home too, but, but they should never cause us to neglect our wives. Even when we are home, husbands, it's important to make sure we are present at home and not still distracted with demands outside the home. I'll confess to you early in our marriage, Amy and I used to joke about my affair with the other woman and, and, and for us, the other woman was my laptop with, with all its emails and projects. And, and well into the late hours of the night, my attention would usually be on that laptop. It'd be on work. Folks, that's as good as not being home at all. And I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, whether we're literally not at home or figuratively we're not at home and our attention is somewhere else, our marriages can suffer and we can get into a lot of trouble when we turn our attention and affections to other things. In the book of Proverbs, a, a wise father tells his younger married son to not get distracted or to not be tempted by the other woman. 
He writes, keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. He later writes, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman? Well, in in the same way, husbands should make it a point to avoid what would otherwise steal their affections from their wives. I'd say wives have responsibility to help guard their husbands from temptation and distraction, too. I love the attitude of the bride in the Song of Songs, chapter 3, where she's evidently lying in bed one night, and, and she rolls over to see if her husband is in bed with her, and he's not. So she immediately gets out of bed and and starts looking for him. The the text reads this way, On my bed by night I sought him who my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him who my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. (laughs) I'll let you guess what she did with him when she got him home. To, to, To be fair, the passage doesn't say what the man was up to while he was going about the city. And, and whether or not he was attending to legitimate business. But, but the point is, regardless of what business the man had at such an hour, the real place he needed to be was at home, in his own bed, with his own wife. And so she went after him and, and, and drug him back to bed. Honestly, though, it, it's not just the husbands who can be selfish or, or preoccupied. Wives, you know, you yourselves can be selfish sometimes and and, and pulled away from meaningful time with your husbands by any number of your own distractions. But the same principle applies. You too should approach the bedroom with a heart to serve your husband. What you don't want to do is take the advice of one prudish 19th century wife who who wrote a so-called marriage manual for young brides uh, in 1894, a lady named Ruth Smithers. And, and I, I really do have to feel sorry for her husband. But Mrs. Smithers gives this advice to young wives. She says, quote, To the sensitive young woman who has had the benefits of proper upbringing, The wedding day is, ironically, both the happiest and most terrifying day of her life. On the positive side, there is the wedding itself, in which the bride is the central attraction in a beautiful and inspiring ceremony, symbolizing her triumph in securing a male to provide for all her needs for the rest of her life. On the negative side, there's the wedding night, during which the bride must pay the piper, so to speak, by facing for the first time the terrible experience of sex. At this point, dear reader, let me concede one shocking truth. Some young women actually anticipate the wedding night ordeal with curiosity and pleasure. Beware such an attitude. A selfish and sensual husband can easily take advantage of such a bride. One cardinal rule of marriage should never be forgotten. Give little, give seldom, and above all, give grudgingly. Otherwise, what could have been a proper marriage could become an orgy of sexual lust. On the other hand, the bride's terror need not be extreme. While sex is at best revolting, and at worst rather painful, it has to be endured, and has been by women since the beginning of time, and is compensated for by the monogamous home and by the children produced through it. It is useless, in most cases, for the bride to prevail upon the groom to forego the sexual initiation, while the ideal husband would be one who would approach his bride only at her request and only for the purpose of begetting offspring. Such nobility and unselfishness cannot be expected from the average man. Most men, if not denied, would demand sex almost every day. The wise bride will permit a maximum of two brief sexual experiences weekly during the first months of marriage, 
and as time goes by, she should make every effort to reduce this frequency. Feigned illness, sleepiness, and headaches are among the wife's best friends in this matter. Arguments, nagging, scolding, and bickering also prove very effective if used in the late evening about one hour before the husband would normally commence his seduction. Clever wives are on the alert for new and better methods of denying and discouraging the amorous overtures of the husband. A good wife should expect to have reduced sexual contacts to once a week by the end of the first year of marriage and to once a month by the end of the fifth year of marriage. And by their 10th anniversary, many wives have managed to complete their childbearing and have achieved the ultimate goal of terminating all sexual contacts with their husband. By this time, she can depend upon his love for the children and social pressures to hold the husband in the home. My, my, my. Um, again, I, I've got to feel sorry for that woman's husband. It really should go without saying, but, but ladies, that's terrible and selfish advice. That, that, that is the opposite of serving your husband. That, that is serving yourself. And, and really, it's not even serving yourself because if you truly believe that sex is terrible, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice as you are robbing yourself of one of the good gifts God has given not just to men, but to women too. But supposing your, your motives aren't as bad as Mrs. Smithers, and you're truly not meaning to be selfish, but you are legitimately distracted from making the time b because of all the things pulling you away. In her book, Feminine Appeal, author Carolyn Mahaney talks about how uh, the, the busyness of homemaking and motherhood often does absorb so much of a woman's time, leaving her with practically no time for her marriage. In one chapter she writes, recently I had a conversation with a young first-time mother. Before our baby was born, she explained, I had plenty of time for my husband. But now there are days I'm, I'm, I'm still in my bathrobe at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because I've spent all morning caring for the baby. How do I keep my husband a priority when my child requires so much time and attention, she asked. Honey, I replied. And by the way, unlike Mrs. Smithers' advice, I, I think this is, this is good counsel. She says, honey... Fix peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for dinner and give him great sex after dinner and he will feel prized. <laughs> In other words, if you're truly spread thin and don't have time for this important part of marriage, something has to give. If, if that's the hot dinners or the ironed laundry or the vacuumed floor or the dusted shelves, none of those things are more important than your marriage. Something's got to give. Remember, the mission is to serve your spouse with Christ-like, self-giving service. That goes for husbands, it, it goes for wives. Well, I've said a lot, as always, so, so much more could be said. Uh, in short, the bedroom plays an important role in the life of a Christian home. And I hope it's fulfilling that role in your home. I hope something I've, I've said here has been helpful. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and encourage you to subscribe to our channel for the next episode in this series. Until next time, thank you for listening, and God bless. Mm -hmm.